Today we're pleased to speak with John Rusted, leader of the Conservative Party of British Columbia and MLA for Necheco Lakes. John has been a lifelong resident of Northern BC with an earlier career spanning over two decades in the forest sector where he founded Western Geographic Information Systems. As a seasoned politician, John has served since 2005, initially representing Prince George Omaneka before moving to Necheco Lakes. His ministerial roles included Minister of Aboriginal Relations and Reconciliation and Minister of Forests, Lands and Natural Resource Operations. After a tenure with BC United, or as we all call it, the BC Liberal Party, John transitioned to the Conservative Party of British Columbia in 2023, rapidly ascending to its leadership. He's been an advocate for resource development and the welfare of local communities. We are now less than a year before the next provincial election, so it's fitting that today's conversation will focus on BC politics going into 2024 as we get John's take on various parties vying for your vote and policies shaping the vision of the Conservative Party of British Columbia. John, welcome to Coastal Front. Thank you very much for having me on. I look forward to our conversation. Yes, well, what, like I said, we're going to spend time, first of all, talking about politics, and then we're going to jump to policy about the Conservative yep. Party of British Columbia. The first thing I'd like you to, to tell, help the listeners and viewers, I mean, we are familiar with the name the Conservative Party at a federal level, but it's a relatively unknown name, if I could say, at the provincial level. And just before we started recording, you'd said that the last time the Provincial Conservative Party of British Columbia elected somebody uh, in Victoria was in the 1970s, is that right? That's correct, yeah. It's, it's actually the oldest party in BC's history. It was the first political party to govern in British Columbia. Really? When political parties are actually founded. Um, and it governed uh, for many years. Uh, then it, uh, as politics shift in BC, which they seem to every generation or two, it went to the, uh, the Liberal Party, then it went to the Social Credit Party, then it went to the NDP, then it went to the BC Liberals, then it went to the NDP. And quite frankly, we're in a position now where we're hoping that the Conservative Party of British Columbia will be the new coalition that uh, leads us forward uh, into the into the next decade of politics, or okay. longer, hopefully. Yeah, great. But it's, yeah, though the, the party hasn't elected anybody since the 1970s, so it's been in the wilderness for a long time. A long time. Well, you're bringing, your goal is to bring it out of the wilderness and back to the mainstream. And you're getting a lot, I mean, we'll, we're going to get into the polls, but you're, you're polling exceptionally well right now. It has been going well, and, you know, I'd, what I'd like to point out is since 1991, we've had 16 years of NDP and 16 years of BC Liberal slash United. Uh, and I think people would be hard pressed to say that, you know, things are better. Right. You know, there's so many issues that are out there that are a real challenge. And I think people are looking for a different, uh, a different approach. Yeah, great. You now have official party status, John, because of Bruce Banman, who's uh, also crossed the floor uh, to join your party from the BC United. You want to talk a little bit about that? Because that just happened a couple months ago. So, it, you know, for my for my journey, of course, I was kicked out of the BC Liberal Party because I dared to question the issue of, of CO2 and and particularly what was going on with farms, but we might get a chance to get into that later. But for Bruce, he actually left the BC Liberal Party. And, and i got to tell you, it's, it's pretty courageous to do that. It's not easy to leave a party that you were elected to, you know, because your voters put you in there based on that party and, and who you were in your riding. Uh, you made all those connections, and you suddenly said, no, uh, I want to come over. But the main reason, you know, Bruce tells me that he came over was he felt silenced. He wasn't able to express his voice. He wasn't able to represent his constituents in the way that he wanted to. And so he was frustrated. And I said, well, that's not what we're about. As a Conservative Party, one of the things I'm going to be saying to all of our candidates is I want them to take a pledge that their number one priority will be their riding, representing their riding, voting on behalf of their riding, speaking on behalf of the riding. And the party actually will come second. Because at the end of the day, that's what you are. You're a, a representative. You're elected to represent. And I don't think that, uh, you know, you should be a representative of the party to the riding. It should be the other way around. Well, this is really well, uh, really good point that I, I personally agree with. And I've said this to a lot of other guests on the show, including, um, you know, Pierre Polyev and, and David Eby when they've been on, is that I, I feel like parties tend to corrupt freedom of uh, independence, thoughts and voice. And especially when you think of an area you come from in Necheco Lakes, which is quite up north. Can you give some, first of all, for our listeners who are Mar Metro Vancouver residents yep. largely, where is Necheco Lakes? Give me so, a So Necheco Lakes is, is uh, if you go up to Prince George, you go west of Prince George. Um, it's an area that is about 2.2 times the size of Vancouver Island. So oh, it's wow. very, very large. It only has about population of about 32,000 people. The largest community is Vanderhoof. 
has about 260 kilometers of Highway 16, including you know, Van Hoof, um, Fort St. James, Fraser Lake, Burns Lake, Grand Isle, Houston, all very small communities, and uh, of course, many people living outside of that in, in very rural areas. So it's, um, of course, I think it's 13 First Nations as well that uh, overlap within that area. So it's a, it's a very rural area, but it's beautiful, right? It's, it's just okay. absolutely beautiful, and the people are just fabulous. Mm-hmm. I, I'm very, very fortunate to have the honor of representing them. Yeah, I have, absolutely. And, and so, so speaking to your idea of, of uh, having anybody who's going to run under the Conservative Party of British Columbia take a pledge that they represent their riding first, you're representing a riding that is drastically different from somebody who maybe is, you know, living in downtown Vancouver. Yes. Um, and, and it does seem like parties tend to, to uh, you know, I say I use the word corrupt, but they tend to silence those independent voices that may be needed in places like where you live. Can you speak to that? Sure. Well, and this was the reason for me being kicked out of the, of the Liberal Party was they had a specific agenda that they wanted to push. And they didn't want anybody to be able to, to speak outside of that agenda because it would take away from the messaging that they're concerned about doing. And ultimately, it actually led to we weren't even allowed to have the discussion in caucus in, in amongst their, us as MLAs in terms of where that policy should be. And that became, um, you know, obviously very frustrating. But ultimately, I said, okay, look, I was elected to represent my riding, to speak on behalf. The issue was around uh, farm emissions reduction strategy, which was reducing nitrogen-based fertilizer. And somehow they think that, you know, cows farting and burping is going to change the weather. And so this is just the kind of nonsense that's going on with this stuff. And so I wanted to speak out about that, and I was told I couldn't. I said I, they told me I had to parrot the party lines. So what I said is I said, look, I was rep- elected to represent my riding. I want to speak on behalf of my riding. They said, fine. If you can't, if you can't parrot our position, you can't be part of caucus. Hung up on me, and half an hour later, I was kicked out. And quite frankly, that's not the way democracy should be. Wow. Uh, this may be going a little bit more into that experience. Did you get a phone call from uh, Kevin Falcon? Or yeah, did so, you? so what had happened is this had all blown up because I did a retweet. It wasn't even an original tweet. It was a retweet of a Patrick Moore tweet, which questioned the role of CO2 and, and had some information about the Great Barrier Reef. And uh, um, that was on a Sunday. I didn't even think anything of it. On the Wednesday, I was taking the day off because the next day was my birthday. And so I put the phone down. Well, I find out, of course, the phone had lit up. Everybody was trying to call me including the the leader and everybody else, right? Because they needed me to take down this retweet. I mean, oh my gosh, you had a retweet, right? Like, you can't do this. <laughs> anyway, the next day, so that, that night I, I sent a note to the leader and said, uh, look, you know, I realized, you know, sorry that I wasn't able to get hold of you. I was taking the day off. Uh, let's ha- let's arrange a time. So we arranged a time and, and I had a phone call with the leader and he's the person who hung up on me and ultimately half an hour later kicked me out uh, for not taking down this retweet. Wow. And so I thought, okay, you know, that's fine. Uh, it was... Turned out that was on my birthday in August, uh, and I thought, okay, interesting decision that they made, but I wondered what I should do after that in terms of politics and whether I should just retire or run as an independent or how to do things. But ultimately, you know, as an independent, you can fight hard for your riding, but you can't change the big issues that need to be addressed. And so that left me with a decision, and I had a long conversation with my wife, and ultimately we decided to stay involved in politics to try to change because that's what got me into politics in the first place. I was never, politics was never an ambition of mine. It wasn't like, oh yeah, I want to be an MLA one day. No, no. Right. I had my own company I was running, but I was so upset with where things were going as a province that, you know, I thought about actually moving to Alberta. And my wife and I, we had once again had this long talk. We said, no, we're going to stay. So that left me two choices. Either I get involved and try to change it or I live with it. Right. And I'm not the kind of person that just takes to live with it. So, yeah. and same issue here is I decided, okay, well, I want to change sort of what's going on. So I explored the options and decided that the Conservative Party of British Columbia was the vehicle that could uh, lead to the type of change that I'm hoping to see for the province of British Columbia. Well, great. Well, great story. That's a great background. Um, we're going to talk a bit in a minute about your polling. Um, and uh, But I do want to start by asking you i'd like to just we're going to walk through we don't there's not not a lot of parties to cover here i'll start with a simple one like a bit of a softball one to start with which is the bc it's the green party of british columbia with sonia first and like yourselves they have two members uh in legislative assembly so two mlas so they're official green officially a party status just like yourselves uh they've never formed government i would think that in many ways their political views are quite different from yours why don't you fill me in on your thoughts of Sonia as a leader, uh, as well as their party, and, and how they contrast to your beliefs? Sure. Um, so, I mean, first of all, actually, it, 
it, occasionally we actually find ourselves voting on the same side. Okay. But sometimes for different reasons. Okay. And I, I'll give you an example yeah. on, on this. And there was a bill that was moved forward that, uh, of course, that because of decriminalization and safe supply, you're allowed to do drugs in public. We oppose that. We don't think that's the right thing to do. Um, and they do. They support it. But so there was a bill that came forward that said, okay, so to help make things easier, we'll say you can't smoke drugs or you can't do drugs in parks or in playgrounds or within six meters of a door. Yeah. So my perspective was that's wrong. It's wrong that somebody should be able to walk down a street smoking a crack pipe, but you can't walk down a street having a beer. Like, <laughs> what's going on here? This is this doesn't make any sense at all. So we voted against that bill because it the restrictions shouldn't have been there because it shouldn't have been allowed to. They voted uh, against that bill because they felt there shouldn't be any restrictions. They should be allowed to do it anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so we find ourselves sometimes voting right. on the same thing, but for different reasons. But with regards to Sonia and, and Adam uh, with the Green Party, I mean, they're very passionate about what they do. Uh, they try to do the best job they can. I, I don't agree with them and align with them on a lot of things. They get quite frustrated at us as a Conservative Party because we take diabolically opposite positions, for example, things like the carbon tax. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I respect them in terms of what they're doing because at least they are consistent in terms of their positions. They don't waffle around. They don't flip-flop. Uh, and you, you kind of know what you get with them. And so, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, okay. who, that's how I describe them. I, I know from when we did interview Sonia uh, quite a few years ago, her riding has a fairly large, and she's in Duncan area, she, a fairly large indig indigenous population. And obviously, Nacheco Lakes also has, as you pointed out, is there anything amongst the sort of indigenous community that you might be aligned on with the, the Green Party or Sonia's views? Um, not really, and, and partly because they believe the solution to help with all of the challenges for, uh, for the indigenous population, for First Nations, is more government support, more government intervention. And what I actually believe, and you know, as, as Minister uh, for Aboriginal Relations and Reconciliation, I signed 435 agreements with First Nations across the province. And what I saw is where we did these large economic agreements, we saw a transition of the community. We saw the number of suicides drop. We saw the number of, of, of social issues drop. We saw employment go up. And that's because they were giving people hope. And so right. our, our position is that we should be trying to create those opportunities you can't have reconciliation unless you have economic reconciliation. They need to be able to engage. They need to be able to have those opportunities. They shouldn't be controlled by government. So it's a little different view from, from their perspective. Right. Okay, good. All right, well, enough about the Green Party of, of British Columbia. I want to jump to the current governing party, the NDP. They have a majority government. Um, they will, we're all going to see an election by the latest October of next year. Sounds like you think there may be an election coming sooner. They've opened a window <coughs> for an election in March, which is quite and interesting. And how do you, what's your, what's your take from that? So for us reason, laymans out there that aren't so politically engaged. So, so the reason why I say that is normally the legislature comes back in the second week of February. They've decided to delay that and not bring it back to the third week. Normally you would give it a throne speech and you would have an opportunity then to talk about your vision, lay it out, people speak to it in the legislature, and then you would go to your budget. And then the same thing, you would talk about it, you have the debate around it, you have voting on it. What they've done now is they've delayed coming in a week, they're putting the throne speech on a Tuesday, then they're putting the budget speech on a Thursday. <coughs> they're jamming them both in and leaving a window for the mandatory four days, five days of debate on the budget which then wraps up on the 29th of February as a confidence vote. That leaves them free and available to then drop the writ and go into election and not have to do the line-by-line -line estimate scrutiny of their budget. So that's the window. They, and whether they go or not will depend on the polls and mm -hmm. you know whether they think it's right for them. But that's where we're worried about, and we, we're cons we think that's likely what they're going to do, and we're preparing for that. Okay. I have a personal saying, which is, if you want to find the truth, follow the money, or follow the money and you'll find the truth. And um, I believe that often when you see a, an election being called early, in this context, in, in possibly March or April, um, there's a, you know, financial statements that come out on how the government did what they spent their money on. And of course, uh, that's all very transparent come around May. That's uh, right. Because it takes about four months after the f uh, year well, end. Th these so. guys tend not to put it out until July or August, but <laughs> right. normally Fair. it would be normally in, in, in May, June that you would get those numbers. Yeah. yeah. And so we know there's been a ton of extra spending going on. There's been a lot of additional administration added to the public payroll that taxpayers are paying for. Um, I'll, speak, I'll stop for a moment and just let's, let's hear. Let, go ahead. 
So, I'd, you know, it's, it's interesting you bring up the budget, right? Because they're, they're running $14 billion in deficit over three years, $6.7 billion deficit this year. And clearly they're out just throwing money off the back of the truck in terms of how they're, how they're spending. So I, I put it this way. So EB likes to say, you know, the economy's doing great. They've got all this employment, all this kind of stuff. So one of two things is true. Either he's misleading about the shape of the economy or they're incompetent in terms of how they manage money. Because if the economy's doing this good, how can we running a six point four billion or six point seven billion dollar deficit? Right, great point. Great point. I, I mean, seriously, <clears throat> if the economy's doing well, you should be able to get to a balanced budget. Mm-hmm. The only time you should be running deficits is to be able to smooth through an economic downturn so that it's not as 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 drastic in terms of the impact on people. Sure. So they're obviously we're doing one or the other. Yeah. And uh, I look at it and I think, okay, the coastal gas link is completed. Trans Mountain is close to being completed. Um, uh, LNG Canada will be completed very shortly. Site C will be completed next year. All of those are major, major contributors to BC's GDP. So you take all those out, and where's our GDP? And I suspect he doesn't want to have that revealed, mm. and he will go to an election beforehand. Now, they're they're obviously in a poll position right now. They've got a majority government, and just historically, you know, in any level of government, any almost any nation the incumbent has an upper hand. Um, so how do you think the NDP is going to handle the messaging of, uh, you know, once they go to drop a, a writ and, and start an election? Like, what, what do you think their, their game plan is going to be? <clears throat> well, I think what they do, and, and what we saw this fall, is they jammed through a tremendous amount of legislation. They had three houses open debating legislation. That's unheard of. The legislature never does that. They forced us to, to go into late night sittings, which I don't mind. You know, it's the work that needs to be done. But we haven't been doing that. And and then they also used closure to, to push these things through because there was too much legislation. There wasn't enough debate time. So why would they do all of that? <clears throat> Once again, they're clearing the deck for spring election. But in the spring, I suspect what they're going to say is most of what they did this fall was around housing. And they're going to say they need a clear mandate to go forward with their authoritarian approach on housing and, and the approach that they think they want to do. And they want to go to the voters and say, give us that mandate. Uh, and and that's that's going to be fun. I'm actually looking forward to debating that as, as we get into the election. But it's clear in my mind that's how they're trying to set up uh, the election in 2024. Okay. I've You just used the word authoritarian. Uh, I think you, was it yesterday you, you referred to David Eby as a, uh, uh, dictatorship style of, of, of leadership, something like that. Yep. Um, so, you know, obviously they're the opposing party to what you, your view is. I mean, um, these are pretty strong words. So look, he's, he's a socialist and I won't mix words. I'll just, I, I'm always straight up with people. And it's just the way I am to a fault. When you look at his approach, he believes very much in government control and, and big government and, you know, pushing businesses out. As with all socialist policies, they eventually fail. Mm-hmm. And what we've seen is failure on all of his policies, whether it's in health care, whether it's in housing, whether it's in health care, whether it's with, with crime, whether it's with drugs, all of these things are failing. And as all socialists do, when they fail, they look for scapegoats and then they start saying, we're going to force this approach to happen. So then they take this authoritarian approach where they come in and say, you no longer have a right to decide which police force you have. You no longer have a right to decide what your community are going to look like, your official community plan. You no longer have the right to decide right. where there's going to be density and where there isn't going to be. So, And that's the approach he's taken because of failed housing policies that they've had to begin with. Right. And that's why I say that he's taken this authoritarian approach. And then he, anybody that tries to oppose, he kind of bullies uh, in that approach. And those are all the signs of somebody that ultimately leads to, you know, the next step, which is becoming a dictator in terms of really you know, being even more forceful in terms of that authoritarian approach. So I use those words, and not to say that he's out there as some radical, but all dictators don't start that way. Right. They start <laughs> off with a very solid ideology, like he does, very much a socialist ideology, the failed policies, and then he comes in with more and more, uh, you know, of a restrictive approach in terms of how he does things. Take healthcare, for example. We're the only jurisdiction in the world that isn't hiring back our healthcare workers. We've got a crisis in right. healthcare. We need our doctors. We they're need not our va- nurses. Some are not vaccinated. Because some aren't vaccinated. We're the only jurisdiction that's, crazy. that's not it's doing a, that. It's unbelievable. And that's all driven because of an ideolo- ideology. Yeah. They believe that if you're not willing to get a vaccine, you shouldn't be working in healthcare. Right. And I'm sorry, when you walk into an emergency room and it's closed, you don't care whether somebody's vaccinated no. or not. You want somebody that's going to be able to address your emergency. Exactly. 
Well said. Okay, we can probably, I'm sure we'll find opportunities to come back to David Eby and the NDP. Um, we've covered off the BC uh, Green Party. Let's finish off with uh, your former party, the BC Liberals, or oops, shall I say the BC United. Uh, I'm just we, we just call them the, 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 the BC United Liberals, okay? <laughs> BC United Liberals. <laughs> So, uh, or, or, you, you, or NDP light. <laughs> many of their policies tend to be that way as well. But anyway, so Kevin Falcon's their leader. He booted you out of caucus. Um, I've got to think you've known him for quite some time because you know you've been. I served with them from 2005 to 2013. Mm-hmm. So I, I do know Kevin, and and uh, we've gotten to know each other over those years as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, what's your take on the BC United Party today compared to what it was when you joined in 2005? That would have been under. Under Gordon, Gordon Campbell. Campbell. Yeah. Um, I mean, my my outside observation, not having ever met either of them, is very different leadership style, very different personalities. Yeah, I, I would agree, right? And, and different from Christy Clark and, and her period and yeah. Andrew Wilkinson as well during his period. So what I, what I would say is this. I mean, I was part of that organization <coughs> for 22 years. I served as an MLA uh, for over 18 years with two cabinet posts. Uh, did lots of things with them, uh, tried to help build that party. I even co-chaired the, one of the leadership campaigns, uh, which was against uh, Kevin Falcon, because I wanted to see change from within the party. Yeah. Unfortunately, the party decided to go in a different direction and, and decided to go backwards in terms of where their policies and thoughts were when they brought in Kevin. And I thought, okay, that's fine, right? I'm not going to create any waves. You know, this is what the, the, the party decided to do. So what I've seen, unfortunately, is the... BC Liberal Party slash United Party used to be a coalition. It used to be, you know, you had free votes. It used to be they actually allowed people to speak up. Mm-hmm. And after Gordon left, that all started to change. And I'm not taking anything away from Christy. I served in cabinet with Christy. She was great. She was an absolutely great premier. I loved working with her. But all of that now has eroded away and to the place where they don't have free votes. In the legislature, if you want to vote against their position and uh, and they basically say, you've got two choices. You either have to come in and vote with our party or don't come into the chamber. You can't vote. Really? So there was a, there was a vote uh, last spring on uh, a motion that the NDP had put forward. The motion was to, that you, to condemn the freedom rallies and to support all of the actions and all the things, measures that were taken for COVID, during COVID. And that included, you know, loved ones dying in a hospital without anybody being able to come in and see them. That included yeah. all these types of things. And so there was a vote on this. And let's say, sure, I, I actually used some political maneuvering to force the vote. They all voted in favor of it with the NDP. There was about seven or eight of them, I think around that number, that didn't want to vote in favor. They were told to leave the building. Really? They were told not even to be in the building, to go out, go golfing or go do whatever you want to do. They weren't allowed to come mm-hmm. in and vote. And that to and me the is culture not, still stands today. And, and that's that's what that's the culture that Kevin had brought in, in terms of it. And so it's no longer the party that it used to be. And quite frankly, it's it's. I don't want to be really unkind, but I could say it's morally bankrupt in terms of you know its positions and and its values. Yeah. And it's flopping around trying to figure out who it is. Uh, it's lost its narrative, and it's mm-hmm. really unfortunate because it was at one point you know a very strong party. Mm-hmm. And, so my hope is, like I say, that's what I'm trying to take the Conservative Party of BC to, is being that new coalition that we move to in this province in terms of the centre-right or the, or the, uh, the, the free-willing uh, people to be able to have an option in the next election. Mm-hmm. Okay. Who was the uh, uh, candidate running for the BC United uh, leadership race that you had been supporting? Uh, Ellis Ross. Ellis Ross. Yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah. I've become friends with Ellis as, yeah. as minister, and, and he's a... He's a great individual. He's yeah. got a lot of strengths, and he wants. He's kind of like me. He's just straight up, you yeah. know, and he'll come out and say these things, and you kind of go, "Yeah, okay." If he's the only one who can say it. That's great. Yeah, <laughs> in yeah. terms of it, uh, but uh, that's why I support him because I thought, you know, he would have those kind of strengths. And lots of people had pushed me and said, you know, you should run for the uh, for the leadership of the of the Liberal slash United Party. And I've always come to the belief, like, it's not an ego thing for me to do this sort of thing. Uh, I've always come to the belief if I find somebody who can do a good job, then I'll support them do it. It doesn't right. have to be me. Right. Oh, good. Well said. The recent Abacus data polling shows that your <coughs> Conservative Party is maintaining a solid second place position behind the NDP with an 18 point gap. And you're right now in some certain areas, you're well ahead of the BC United Party. 
um, to me, you define the definition of unintended consequences. I'm pretty sure that Kevin Falcon wasn't anticipating this. Uh, I'm sure he wasn't. Uh, <laughs> and quite frankly, I wasn't anticipating this either, right? I mean, this wasn't this wasn't premeditated to come and do this. Right. Um, it was. I was kicked out and wondering where that path would go. But really, when you look at the Abacus poll, uh, we're actually leading the United Party in every corner of the province. And in the north, in the interior, and I would argue uh, in throughout the valley, we're actually leading the NDP as well wow. in that poll. So I, I'm very proud of what we've been able to do. It's, now it's a snapshot, but you can see the progress that we've been making in terms of being able to, to reach out to people. And part of it is, as you, we talked about at the very beginning, um, most people say the Conservative Party of BC, I didn't realize we had one. Right, exactly. And so we're, we're opening people's eyes and, and minds to who we are and what we represent and what we're trying to do. And we'll be, of course, filling this with um, uh, our policy approaches. And we've had a few that come out now, but we'll be doing more certainly in the new year so people have a good sense of who we are as a party and what we're trying to achieve in British Columbia. Well, it's interesting that, you know, there's only two of you. Um, your voice is fairly new. You mentioned that your party itself has been in, out in the wild for a long time. You don't even have a lot of necessarily policies formed, yet you're getting this huge amount of uh, support behind you. So I almost wonder if maybe there's just a, that's a result of, of people wanting to change. You, you mentioned at the very beginning of our conversation, 16 years of BC Liberals, 16 years of NDP. Are we really ever, are, are people better off in this province? And so I, I, I wonder, well, maybe maybe a lot of this, which is being driven by dri driving this, is just people want to change. People do want to change. And there's people that didn't vote that are looking and saying, wait, wait a second, we might have an option. But where I think we're also polling very strong is actually with the younger voter, 18 to 35. And there's a reason for that. When you talk to people and they say, I'm working two jobs, I'm struggling to be able to put food on the table, I can barely pay my rent, I have no ability to be able to put any money away for my retirement. I have no ability to ever hope to own a home. That's not a very good place to be. I mean, the dream is to be able to uh, provide for your family, to be able to put money away, you know, for your future and you know, hopefully own your own home, you know, apartment, whatever that may be. That's lost. And people are saying, why am I doing this? They want to see a path that can lead to hope. And so they're open to what we're talking about because they, they're actually having that hope that perhaps there is something that can be done differently. Perhaps we don't have to be mired in these things, these issues that we have today. And, you know, there's the old saying, right, you can't solve problems uh, with the same level of thinking that created it. Well, well said. That's good. Well, on this concept of hope, let's pivot our conversation now to um, policies or ideologies of yourself and the Conservative Party of British Columbia so that the listeners and viewers who are listening to this maybe for the first time not realizing there is an option for them to vote in a more center-right uh, leaning direction, um, how your views are different than those of the NDP and the uh, BC United. I'd like to start with uh, going back to why you got booted out of the BC United Party in the first place. You mentioned Patrick Moore retweet that you did um, talking about um, climate change and so, John, what we have here is a, um, a sort of printed piece uh, about um, the British Columbia um, having collected and removed nearly $39 billion from the BC economy because of the carbon tax. Yeah. Um, have I got that right? Yeah, it's by, by 2030, uh, by 2030, 2031, that's what will have been taken oh, that's, from that's the will, economy. will be taken. Yes. Through the BC Collectively economy. from now till then. Yeah. Okay. So why don't we start with your view on this carbon tax sure and and is it is it having a positive impact on fighting climate change so and everybody always asks me this question and you haven't asked me so but i'll answer it anyway yeah so climate change is real yeah right our climate is changing and even though david eby likes to stand up and say he denies that climate change no no that's nonsense i i've always challenged him show me one quote one tweet one social media post but of course he never does that he just likes to make the accusation um so climate change is real Man is impacting our climate, there's no question. CO2 has a warming impact on our temperatures. So not all of that is true. The issue is that there are hundreds of other factors that contribute towards our changing climate. It's not just CO2. It's just one component that's in there. And David Eby likes to say, oh, CO2 is pollution. It's pollution. we got to stop this pollution. I'm sorry, we're carbon-based beings? What don't you get about the fact that carbon is essential to life for carbon-based beings? <laughs> like, there is no plant life. <laughs> 
it'd be impossible on this planet unless you're above 150 parts per million in, in terms of what it is. And, and, and so <clears throat> this, this fixation on carbon uh, is, in my opinion, is a red herring. Our climate is changing. We need to be able to adapt to that changing climate in order for us to be able to prosper in this province. And that's what our policies and approaches are. So you look at you know, the carbon tax, for example. So it's designed to try to get us to stop using fossil fuels because so, so, you know, so, so everybody thinks those are bad. Okay, I get it. That's, that might be a good, while, good goal to have. But let's be realistic about that. So what does that mean? So if you're taxing people's fossil fuels, what you're doing is you're taxing food production, you're taxing right. the transportation of all of our goods, you're taxing our ability to move around, to take our kids to hockey games, to go to medical, uh, medical appointments, to get back and forth to work. And they say, well, well, you can use electric vehicles. Well, wait a second here. <laughs> so the reality is a carbon tax is basically taxing people into poverty in an attempt to change the weather. It's ridiculous. Right. It makes no sense whatsoever. Ne- never mind the fact that it's just absolutely impractical. Well, uh, I mean, it, I, I drive a, yes. a, an F-150 Lightning, yeah. and it's a great city truck. I can plug it in every night in my home in Vancouver, drive downtown, which is about a four-kilometer drive, and drive home, and it, no problems. It ma- makes total sense. Once a year, I'll drive out to <clears throat> Kelowna for a hockey tournament. Yeah. And it, the range says 500 at the beginning, but I know my range is like 200 kilometers because well, these things don't well do well if you have a payload. And they don't do well if you have to drive hills, and they don't do well if you have cold weather. Look, and I think up where you if, live, if you, you got turn, all three of those. If you turn on your heater, yeah, cut your range at least a half. Yeah. Or if you turn on your air conditioning, <laughs> right. for that matter, right? I mean, this is just what it is. <clears throat> but, you know, let's be realistic. So what it, when, it, when you talk about the carbon tax, it's taking, you know, this year we'll take $2.8 billion out of people's pockets. $2.8 billion is hard to picture. What does that mean? Mm-hmm. For the average person, I mean, $2.8 million just sort of rolls off the tongue and people's People kind of get lulled to sleep by it. So what that actually means is every time you go to the pump and you fill up your car and you have a 60-liter tank and you fill that up, between the carbon tax and the low carbon emission standards, you pay about $16. Right. That's the equivalent to going to Costco and buying two rotisserie chickens. Yeah. Every time you go to the pump. Yeah. And so the accumulative of this, by 2030, 2031, people will have paid about 6700 and seventy-two dollars per person, uh, or for a fam- tax or, for, or family of four, yeah. you'll have paid over twenty-seven thousand dollars in carbon tax. Yeah, collectively with, across with the province, tax thirty-nine dollars. billion dollars. Right. Exactly. This is after-tax yeah. dollars, yeah. and not to mention, of course, don't forget you pay the GST on the carbon tax. So, the federal has got to get their their pound of flesh in there too, right? Yeah. But so you look at it and think, okay, what's it actually doing? Well, when you look at our consumption of fossil fuel per capita. We're no different than the rest of the country, even though we've got the highest prices. Yeah. So it hasn't done anything to change the way we actually do things. And certainly, like I say, taxing people into poverty is not going to change the weather. Half the people are struggling to put food on the table. Well, so, and, they, and, and many of these people, especially up where you live, it's not like they have an alternative anyways. Exactly. For, for a lot of people. But for the farming sector. Sure. It's not like they're going to be able to go to you know electric, electric um, yeah. uh, tractors. Right. Right. And, and for the trucking sector electric truck, you know, transportation trucks, uh, it'd be very difficult. However, you know, one interesting little thing, and a little side note, sorry, but there's a company in British Columbia, and in actually of all places, in Merritt, that has built the first transportation truck that BC has built since the 1950s, and it's an electric truck. But it only has about two hours of lifetime, which of course would say, well, that's useless. So what they've done is they put a diesel generator on it (laughs) to recharge the batteries. And what they claim is that'll save about 50% of the, of the diesel that they would use. Not to mention you get all the benefit of, of the electric uh, the electric drive for, for power. Okay. And so it's, it's fascinating. I, I want to see the stats where that plays out. They're out, you know, they've got a, one of these things out there and there's companies that want to have these as testing. But here is an innovation from British Columbia. They're doing something that nobody else in the world is doing and potentially could have huge savings in terms of the amount of diesel that's being used. And we aren't even looking at that. Right. Right. Why wouldn't we do that? Yeah, good point. So to summarize, when it comes to the carbon tax, is it fair to say that you're you're just completely opposed to it? Yeah, just You'd get rather, rid of it. Yeah, get rid of it entirely. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, obviously, there's things attached to that. <clears throat> so, for example, the other things attached to it is the new building codes, which talk about all these green standards that need to be put in place. That's going to add between thirty and $80,000 to the cost of a new home. Mm-hmm. People can't afford homes now. Right. Yeah. Why? Why would we be wanting to add cost to it? Yeah. So these sort of things have to be, have to change and, and be taken out. 
Uh, of course, there's all these programs, and I like to refer to them basically as a slush fund or a government's wish fund, you know, things like Clean BC and those types of things yeah. that, that have to be eliminated. But I want to return that money back to taxpayers. Well, I think this is a really valid point because the thing that the thing is important to understand is when the government takes this money out of someone's pocket, you know, a farmer up north in your neighborhood, because they're polluting the environment while they're driving their tractor trying to produce food for families in Metro Vancouver, and they take money out of their pocket, <coughs> charge them on a carbon tax <coughs> to then give it back to somebody else within the province. It's not like it goes a dollar into Victoria and a dollar comes out. Yeah, you know, I used to I used to love watching or listening to Paul Harvey, and I, you're old enough probably to remember yeah. Paul Harvey as a as a broadcaster from from the years by. And what Paul Harvey used to say is, look, government providing help is like giving a, a blood transfusion from your right arm to the left arm. Only when government does it, they manage to spill half of it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah, that's a good one. And it's very true. And it, but it's, it's very true, right? And so the other thing to think about on, on climate is, you know, to adapt um, and for us to be able to prosper. You also have to think about food production. British Columbia only procures 34% of the food we consume from British Columbia. We only grow 34% of what we, cons- what we consume. The rest mm-hmm. of it is reliant on south of the border and a little bit from the rest of Canada. So if they're going to be changing their policies and with a changing climate, we're vulnerable. Because sure. if they're if they've got food shortages, we're not going to be the first place they ship food to. Yeah, and we have the potential to grow just about anything we want here. I mean, obviously, we're not going to be growing bananas and yeah. pineapples, but we can grow just about anything we want here. We need to actually be focused on increasing our agriculture production in this province as a way to make sure that we can adapt to our changing climate and look after our people at the same time. Okay, John, let's switch from talking about climate change and carbon tax to another hot topic. Re- a research poll conducted in May of 2023 found that 59% of British Columbians believe criminal activity in their community has increased in the past four years. This reflects a growing negative perception of public safety in the region. Additional 52% of British Columbians fear being victims of crime to a significant degree, which is a concern being particularly high among younger residents. And of course, we're here in Metro Vancouver. Most of our listeners and viewers live in the Metro Vancouver, and I can tell you firsthand this is something many people are concerned about, uh, particularly down here in, in Metro Vancouver. You know, my wife and I were living in Yale Town. Uh, 2012, 2013, our daughters were born. She was taking them uh, 2013, 14 down to a local playground, and she noticed uh, there were people shooting up drugs in, in the playground. And she came to me and said, Andrew, we, we ought to move out of here. This is, I, I can't take my, we can't, t- we can't take our children to a playground where there's needles. Um, you're obviously up north. I don't know if it's the same perception about crime up north, um, but why don't you talk for a moment about what if 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 the Conservative Party of British Columbia was to form government, what would you do right away to address this rising concern over crime and and concern over being a victim of crime? So I mean, this is a this is a big topic. So I hope we have lots of time to talk about we it don't. because we've touched we got, on a lot because we got another lot of got other wins. So exactly. Let's so, get yeah. So I'll get to the Coles notes of the, of this and and. I think it's, you know, you look at it and the reality is people are feeling not as safe. And there's a whole a bunch of reasons for that. There's policies that have built up over the years, and especially under this NDP, which seems to think that, you know, the victim, the, the, um, uh, the criminals, the rights of criminals are just as important or more important than the rights of victims. And that's just, that's just wrong. What we need to do on this is multi-prong. So, take the addiction thing out for a second because I, I want to be able to touch on that as well but on the on the crime side uh, we don't have enough court time where our courts are plugged up they need actually to be modernized we need to actually mm-hmm. to streamline it COVID showed us that we can so why aren't we doing this we don't have crown, crown prosecution only one in three or one every four cases actually goes through crown prosecution we have this revolving door in terms of in terms of bail that's putting these people back out on the streets yes. that's federal because we can't change the criminal code provincially but we need to be advocating for changes to that. Uh, We actually need, as a society, to say it's okay to put people in jail for committing a crime. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Yeah. It's okay for people to go to jail. That's the punishment. There has to be punishment because right now criminals are like getting a slap on the hand thinking, well, that's nothing. I'll go out and do more crime. Yeah. Right? There's no deterrent. And then the the big piece is um, we actually need to deal with these prolific offenders, these people that are just these repeat offenders uh, particularly these violent, pr- prolific offenders, and if we cannot get them put away through the um, through the courts, then quite frankly, we should actually look at the Mental Health Act, 
if somebody's at risk of harming themselves or, or others, they can be held under the Mental Health Act and treated until they're no longer considered to be a risk. Okay. The province needs to actually have enough courage to say, we're going to make our, seat strafe, seats, our, our streets safer. We're going to take these people off the streets. We're going to make sure they get treated. Okay. Now, you've got this problem with addictions as well, and, and that's a little bit, that's other complex. You've got to get rid of this safe supply. There's no such thing as safe supply. We've got this the hydromorphine, I think it's called, one of the safe supply drugs. It's finding our way into our schools. The, the addicts are buying are getting this product from the government. They're then selling it to the dealers to get the more powerful drugs. The dealers are then taking it and selling this safe supply to kids in our schools. Yeah. And one of our one of the people who's running for us is a doctor on the North Island. She told me she one of and she specialized in in treating addictions. Uh, one of her clients that she had one of the patients come in was a high school student, and she asked, "Well, how many other people in high school are are addicted to this hydromorphone?" And he said, well, at least 30. Wow. This was a small high school. Like, this is the next generation of addicts. This safe mm-hmm. supply thing has got to end. This decriminalization... Well, it clearly we, hasn't worked because no. if you look at the number yeah. of people dying from illicit drugs by the BC Coroner's report that gets published uh, it's basically monthly, but you look at their annual report, the numbers just keep going higher and higher. It, it's horrendous. So how, you know, you can't, it's pretty impossible for anybody who believes in safe supply to be able to justify it because it's clearly not working. And, and, and the same goes with decriminalization. I mean, we haven't been arresting people for simple possession or use for decades. Right, exactly. Right? But what decriminalization has done is it's taken a tool away from the police. When the police see cars going back and forth to a dealer, you know, drug dealer, yeah, they can no longer stop that car and seize the drugs and use it for evidence to go after the dealer. Right. Because it's now legal for them to have that. Exactly. And so you've taken a tool away from the police to actually even go after the dealers. Yeah. Absolutely crazy. So on the addiction side, what we need to do is we need to be having a range of services, everything from doctor prescribed treatments to voluntary treatment to involuntary treatment, and quite frankly, to long-term treatment. Because there are some people who are um, basically damaged beyond repair. And, yeah. and it is inhumane to leave them living on a street in in urine and feces and, and those conditions we should actually have a place for them to be able to be to to see to receive the treatment that they can have and have at least some sort of quality of yeah, life. I completely agree. I mean, I, I think it's um, unfortunate when people want to pretend or think so, somehow think that every single person on the street could eventually just get a job and and live a, a healthy life. I mean, there are people who are just beyond you know recovery, or they never were able to be there in the first place, and you know, they have terrible schizophrenia and they have and whatever pe- other conditions people need to be treated as individuals as well it's not yeah. a one-size-fits-all it's not everybody right, needs exactly. housing or everybody needs you know mandatory treatment or what like you need to be able to have a range you need to be able to treat people individually and have an individual recovery program and that could include a, a suite of services over time to keep people on a path to recovery yeah would you support the reopening of uh, institutions like Riverside Hospital? You need to have some place. Yeah. And whether it's Riverside or whether it's some other place, you know, I, I, yeah, those definite needs to be done. And I, I get there'll be some people that say that's unfair and stuff, but the yeah. reality is it's I think it's inhumane not to. Okay, let's talk about SOGI. For those listeners who are not familiar, SOGI stands for Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity. A coastal front actually recently, a couple of months ago, went out to a yeah mm. we yeah we went out and filmed the one million march for children, uh, and then and then there was a massive counter protest to it and uh, Reed and Lawrence were out there filming that, um, and uh, it was really we got, we actually got a great uh, commentary from a fellow who considers himself a socialist. I forget the fellow's name, but Stuart, Stuart Parker, uh, but he was quite you know he was part of the uh, he was the sort of anti Soji group. Um, can you maybe first start by talking a bit about what your view is of the mandate by our provincial government on SOGI, social, uh, sexual orientation, gender identity, sure. and why you oppose what they're doing? So first of all, I don't like to think of people as being anti-SOGI or pro-SOGI. I don't like divisions. Okay. But what I do like is I believe strongly in parents and parents' rights. <clears throat> parents should have the right to be able to decide how they want their kids to be educated. They should have the right to be able to be involved in their children's education. And the SOGI and the approach that's in there is actually taking that away. The second thing is SOGI as itself has become very divisive Mm -hmm. within our schools and within our society. And so if something is that divisive, why are we doing this as a government? Like we shouldn't be doing this. It, It needs to be removed. And the third thing I think that's most important is everybody should be able to feel safe in our schools. 
if a nine-year-old girl, and I, I talked to uh, parents in, in Kelowna that said this, a nine-year-old girl's going to school and holding it and running home to go to the bathroom because she doesn't feel safe. That's not right. Mm-hmm. Children should be able to be safe. You know, a six-year-old boy comes home and says, Grandpa, is it okay that I'm a boy? These are kids. Let them be kids. Yeah. Our school needs to be focused on teaching kids how to think, mm-hmm. not what to think. Right. And it should be refocused on academics, providing kids with the best tools and options they can for their future, and let's leave the social issues for families to deal with. Mm-hmm. Let's also make sure our schools are safe to make sure there's a strong anti-bullying program and support that needs to be in there for all students and families where there is those issues as well. But let's not you know, create these divisions and bring it to an end. Yeah, absolutely. You know, as I mentioned earlier, I have a 11 and 12, uh, t- 11 and 10 year old daughters and a seven year old son, and I'm listening to my daughters coming home from school, and they seem often confused. Thankfully, my wife and I are kind of setting the story straight on how things work in the real world, uh, but they often come can home confused, thinking, um, you know, are they gay or are they trans? Or are they? You know, when you got I, when you got a grade one or two <laughs> student who's presented with a, with a piece of paper on the table and with a picture of a boy and a picture of a girl and a line between them and ask, where are you on the spectrum? <laughs> huh? I, I'm sorry, like what? Yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> I, t- I can tell you from my seven-year-old boy's perspective, some days he dresses up as a unicorn. And, and, and what's wrong with that? <laughs> exactly. that? That's great. Let kids be kids, yeah, right? Exactly. And as they get older and find their path in life and support them in terms of who they are and what right. they're trying to be, then let them make decisions as to where they go. But let's let kids be kids. Let's not confuse children with these sort of things. Yeah, absolutely. And and quite frankly, some of the material that is in the libraries in these schools and yeah. that's available, yeah. I find incredibly offensive. Yeah. And and just the language that's used. We it seems the, like nobody we wants the to stand and speak up against well, this, though. And, well, it's because I, of the I cancel culture. I watched that piece of your... Yeah. It's because of the cancel culture. And, you know, so Bruce Bannon, you know, he, my, my colleague, stood up in the legislature and read from a book. Right. Oh, sorry, that was Bruce, not yeah, yourself. Yeah, Bruce, and he, that was he great. read, he read that from was... a book, and the, and the speaker said, you know, sorry, you're not allowed to use that language in here. Okay. Yeah. I, you know, apologize. Yeah. Sorry, we're using yeah. that. Why is this available to an 11-year-old kid? Yeah. At in our school. Li- yeah, in a, in a school library. If you library. can't say it in the legislature, yeah. <laughs> an 11-year-old kid can have it and available. Like, yeah. Something's wrong with piece. their education system. Yes, yeah. everybody should watch that one. That was a good one. Um, ICBC, uh, the provincial government recently moved to a uh, no-fault policy. Um, <clears throat> you guys have just come up with a, a – uh, you'd like to tweak that or uh, modify it. Can you talk about that for a moment? Sure. So no-fault – ICBC, of course, you know, had huge budget problems. There was There was – huge costs that were going on, particularly with soft tissue issues. Uh, issues. So they brought in no fault. And that, to me, makes sense. Okay, you know, set it up and, and have it go through, not have to do all the court time and all the rest of the kind of stuff. It's good for, for people and it's good for, the, for keeping rates low. Um, that's fine. But where you have serious injuries, life-altering injuries, I don't think it's right that a Crown Corporation should say, you get this many days with this doctor, you get this many days of rehab, uh, and you're done for the rest of your life right this is it this is what we're going to provide you with yeah i don't think that's right for a crown corporation to make that decision i actually think that as a you know as a victim of of you know obviously a horrific accident hopefully that would never happen to anybody but you should be able to hire a lawyer and defend your rights defend what you need to be able to recover and live some side of quality of life that you can going forward I don't see anything wrong with that. It should not be dictated by a government. Mm-hmm. So that's sort of the change that we want to make. In addition to that, you know, that then opens up the potential for some competition for ICBC, and I think that would be healthy. Great. I want to go back to these three parties. <clears throat> My question is going to be, what's one policy that you've seen them move forward with or propose um, that just makes you shake your head? Um, and so we'll start again, we'll go back, we'll start with the Green Party to start. I'm sure there's plenty you can choose from, but I want, as we finish up this conversation, what's something, and I'm talking about something recent, not something from five or six years ago. So yeah. what's something that Sonia or, uh, what's the other fellow's name? Adam. Adam. Sonia yeah. or Adam have come out with that you're just like, oh, really? Well, of course, I, I mean, it's, it's pretty easy to pick from because they're so diabolically opposite from what we want to do yeah. uh, in terms of it. But I would say um, the fact that uh, they want us to completely eliminate fossil fuels. Right. Okay. okay. 84% of the energy we consume in this province is fossil fuels. Only 16% is electricity. To completely eliminate it, we would have to build out 
between five and six times as much electrical capacity, capacity as we have as a province. So yeah. Five or six times all the dams, the five or six times all the transmission, everything that needs to be done. There's not even a, f- a, a moment of thought from them as to how that could actually yeah. be achieved in any kind of realistic time frame. It's, it's co- completely and so that's why I just, I just When they say that, I just kind of go, oh, come right. on, guys. Yeah. Do a yeah. little math. Yeah. And it's one thing I love to say, and I've got to say it this way. Math is impervious to BS. <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, that one I agree with because as a side business, I'm, I've got uh, an EV charging company that we're trying to launch, and I have never experienced such challenges in launching a company. And it's namely the logistical nightmare of working with BC Hydro and the capacity for them to be able to deliver. Yeah. I mean, we had, there's just, there's no way in a million years we're getting to zero carbon at 2030, 2040, so 2050. Let, in a let million me just years. put one little project, yeah. and I know we're probably going over yeah. time. So this, yeah. But in Prince George, there's a, a proposal to produce hydrogen, produce ammonium for, for export and hydrogen. Great project. Love the idea. It's going to take up the entire power of Site C. <laughs> right. So <laughs> wait a second. We need this power for ratepayers in this province. We need this power for homes, for electric yeah. vehicles, for heat pumps, for all these other things. So if we're going to give all that power to them, what does that mean? That means we're going to have to create, generate more of this power at obviously a much higher price. Yeah. So that means we're going to have a company that's going to go forward, that's going to be locked in, have a contract for all this power that's being produced, and our rates are going to have to go up because we're going to have to buy our power somewhere else. Exactly. If that's a business decision, that's great. But <laughs> yeah, you know, I don't know if people around, particularly in the lower mainland, would be really keen on exactly. that. Exactly. <laughs> I can tell you, I can tell you that there is no way this province is going to meet any kind of mandates around electrification by vehicles or homes, unless we start building four or five site seed dams tomorrow. Yep. Okay. Let's now jump to the BC NDP. Okay, a recent policy or something they've come through with by David Eby and the, and the BC NDP, where you're just like, oh, really? So let's let's stay on the same theme because I could pick many things from them as well in terms of what they're doing. Things like you know, have, allowing a, somebody to walk down a, a street with a crack pipe and you yeah. know those sort of things. But let's let's pick with the electric vehicles because we're we're talking about it. Yeah. <clears throat> if we wanted to replace all the transportation in British Columbia with electricity, we would need to triple the amount of electricity we produce. Thirty percent of the energy we consume is elect- is, is for transportation. Mm-hmm. That's equivalent to building twenty site sea dams. Yes. Okay, so let's take out all the trains and planes and stuff. It was, you're still talking about, you know, another four or five sight sea dams to do this. So the absolute lunacy that I saw was their targets to say 100% of all the vehicle sales by 2035 will have to be electric. And I get people want electric vehicles, yeah. they like it, that's great. So first of all, there's no realistic way that there's not going to be that many cars produced. All the producers of electric cars are pulling back. Second thing, Ford is losing like $35,000 per vehicle they built because right. they have to subsidize it. Where do you think the prices of electric vehicles are going to go? Completely yeah. unrealistic and no way to have the power. Yeah. So that's when I just shake my head and I think, yeah. once again, it's virtue signaling by this government it is. so that they can look good as opposed to actually being realistic and taking people's lives, the people's uh, quality of life into consideration. Yeah, yeah. well said. I mean, this mandate is just going to not ever happen. No, it's never going to happen. And all it's going to do is drive up costs along the way. Yep. All right, last one. Your former party, BC United, uh, BC Liberal Party, Kevin Falcon, pick a pick a policy that they're big on that you're just like oh, glad I'm not part of that program <laughs> well, anymore. Well, the thing is, I could, I could pick many policies, but they're flip flopping around, so you never know exactly where they're going to okay. land on things anymore. But they're I will say, driven are they or what? What's that? Are they poll driven? Uh, no, anything we do, they flip around on because oh. they realize we're getting traction and they want to try to figure oh, out see. how to okay. get traction. But well, one thing I would say is this: when we attacked Soji in the house, and the premier got up and defended Soji, and he was just over the top blasting us. The BC United members gave up, stood up, and gave the Premier a standing ovation in support of Soji. That one made me laugh. Okay. They're going to the polls, and they are asking for a mandate, and they're up there giving a standing ovation to the Premier of the province of British Columbia. That's why I call them NDP and NDP light. Right. <laughs> okay. So, John, if listeners are, are watching this on YouTube or listening to it on their favorite podcast channel, and they want to get involved, and it sounds like you're anticipating a, an election fairly soon. Um, we're filming this in, in uh, early December, so we could be talking about elections three, four months from now. How do they get involved? What do they What do they What do they need to do? Go to conservativebc.ca, uh, become a member, sign up, help to volunteer, join some of our teams. 
Uh, we've got, uh, I think, close to 200 people that have expressed interest in running for us as we're building out uh, our candidates. Obviously, we're going to be running 93 candidates in the next election. So check us out. Check out what we're doing. You know, follow us certainly on social media. Get involved in some of these conversations. And I hope, you know, get involved in campaigns. Because at the end of the day, elections, democracy, is made by those who show up. Right. And so if you want change, if you want to be part of something exciting and new in this province and, uh, you know, a party that, you know, I believe is going to be have, a, have a good vision for how we can get to a much better place and how we can realize our full potential this province, get involved, reach out to us. We'd love to have you as part of our team. Great. Well said. John Rusted, MLA for uh, Necheco Lakes, uh, as well as the leader of the Conservative Party of British Columbia. Thank you for being on Coastal Front today. It's been a great, great Thanks conversation. Thanks for having me on. I've okay. enjoyed our conversation. Okay. Thanks, John.